Welcome to the uh, first meeting of the Finance Committee for 2015. Glad you can all make it through the, uh, through the snow. The, uh, to cut expenses, each of you will get a snow shovel on the way out to, so we could get Mass Ave clear. Uh, we have two new members on the Finance Committee this year. Um, Jonathan Wallach, if you want to like, raise your hand or something, <coughs> and uh, Rohit, Rohit Devade. Um, I thought we could just go around the, the room so they can start getting a feel of who everybody is. There'll be a test tomorrow um, on all this. So, Charlie? Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8. Helen Jones, Precinct 14. Aaron Margaret Frankenmont, Precinct 5. Ron Wallach, Precinct 7. Mary Gibson, Precinct 7B. Paul Rader, Precinct 16. Dean Harmon, Precinct 20. David Penner, Precinct 21. Ted Sessions, Precinct 21. Okay, well, I'm uh, uh, glad everybody was here. We got a good attendance. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody uh, that there's this ethics conflict of interest uh, thing we have to do every two years. So I think Gloria sent out all the papers to everybody. Uh, if you did not get it from Gloria, please you know, uh, touch bases with her and she could send them out again. Uh, my understanding is that you've got one certificate which says you've got the uh, summary of the conflict of interest. And uh, don't just sign that, actually go through it so you can understand it. And then there's another certificate that says that you went online and you completed the course. Uh, all of this paperwork should be gotten back to me. If you've sent it to somebody else, at least CC me and I'm gonna, you can send it hard copy and I'll keep a file um, or, or send it to me electronically and I'll put it in a file also. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with it, but uh, I'll, I'll at least have it. And it's supposed to be due by April 3rd. Uh, so you have until April 3rd, but uh, uh, try to get it out of the way so it's not hanging over. Um, okay, we have a reserve fund transfer. It was the first item for collection software. Uh, Stephen Gilligan is on his way down here, so I'll put that off until he gets here. Um, we have the... Uh, Tell you what, why don't we do uh, the snow and ice deficit uh, and get that vote out of the way. Uh, so let me turn it over to the manager uh, to tell you where we are right now. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so if we had been meeting about uh, three weeks ago, we would have told you the snow and ice budget was going great and we were probably gonna come in under budget this year, but the past two weeks happened. Uh, so we uh, provided you a memo from the DPW director to uh, me that's outlining costs to date for snow and ice removal and then some of the expected costs we have uh, over the next week or so, not counting any further snowfall. Uh, so very quickly you can see that we've had about 17 snow and ice events, uh, 53 plus or minus 53 inches of total snowfall. Um, our total appropriation for FY15 is 771000 uh, what we have spent so far totals that amount you see expended to date, $903,725. Uh, broken out in the different, uh, different categories you see below. Uh, beginning tonight, uh, we're going to begin to remove snow from Mass Ave uh, at the Cambridge border over the next four nights up to the Lexington line to widen travel lanes. Uh, we expect that to cost in the vicinity of uh, 75000 to 100000 as you see outlined here, uh, and we also, we've been in an interim basis snoring, uh, storing snow in the reservoir parking lot. Uh, however, our commitment to the neighborhood as to not have that, uh, you know, sort of be seen as a, a consistent dumping area is to regularly truck that out. So you see uh, an estimated $25,000 cost to move the snow that's there out. So what we're asking for tonight um, is approval from the Finance Committee, uh, a vote of the Finance Committee to authorize us to deficit spend up to $750,000 more in snow and ice. Uh, so that would, in effect, based on the figures you've seen uh, here on this memo, give us about another half a million dollars of limit 
uh, to spend on snow and ice. Um, so wh where would we pay for that would be the next question. Uh, there is a million dollar reserve fund. Uh, I believe we've only taken a limited amount out so far this year. Uh, and there's also uh, in the budget uh, every year we include a hold uh, on $500,000 to carry a deficit. So we have means of paying for this, uh, but we need this um, voted authority to, to actually deficit spend to allow the comptroller to have us spend the money. Uh, what would you, um, by the time we wrap up the budget, you know, in early April, uh, hopefully we'll have fi yes. fairly final numbers on what the snow and ice deficit is, and then we can decide how much to take from the, uh, uh, from the deficit, in other words, that we've got built into the long-range plan which the manager will be growing, and how much to take out of the reserve fund. Uh, but this allows them to continue to spend for the job, and then we'll, we'll figure out the final numbers in late March, early April on that. Um, so what they're doing is, before they could deficit spend, it's the only budget that could legally be done that, they have to have the approval of the Finance Committee and the Selectmen, or just the Finance Committee? Okay, just the Finance Committee. Uh, so are there any questions from the committee for the manager? Christine? So this year, we have several uh, contracts we put out. So we sort of tiered a, a couple contracts based on availability. Uh, so it's between Bill Ricca or a site in Cambridge. Private sites. If anybody would like to volunteer their driveway. <laughs> Grant? Uh, have we um, thought about um, ice melters? So we have. Mike Rademacher has done actually quite a bit of research on it. The, the problem becomes we don't, we don't have a snow farm now. We don't have a dumping site now. To have real and, an adequate or efficient melting site uh, system, you need to have a place to bring it and then melt it so that you have larger storage. Um, so we don't, really don't have that kind of space. And then from a cost-benefit point of view, um, talking to some communities that have them and with uh, Mike Rademacher speaking to some vendors, uh, e even the vendors admit they break down extremely, uh, extremely regularly. Uh, you, th you can't really use them in every snow situation. This would certainly be a situation where you'd use them. Uh, but, you know, if you're getting your, your, I guess I'd say, more normal winter, it doesn't necessarily uh, avail itself to that use. So if it sits for a while, uh, they, they don't, they're, not, they're not good at doing that. And you've got to pump a lot of fuel into them. Uh, so they're very costly to operate. So that, our assessment's been that it's not a good investment for our needs. Um, so we have given it consideration. All right, thanks. Okay. Are, are there other questions? Thank you. Okay, so what the manager is requesting under the uh, statute uh, is for a vote of the Finance Committee to expend another 750000 That doesn't mean you've seen the budget. Um, that doesn't mean they'll spend all that, but uh, it doesn't want to have to come back to us every week uh, to do that. So, uh, do I have a motion for the no, 750? No, no. Okay, moved and seconded to allow for the expenditure of an additional $750,000 is authorized by <coughs> Section 31D of Chapter 44 of the General Law. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. One. Right, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, zero. Okay. Uh, that takes care of that. Um, okay, let me, let me just go through a little bit of uh, other business. Uh, Alan, you had something you wanted to ask the Finance Committee? I just wanted to mention that uh, the local news team from Arlington Cable is, in the, is just beginning to produce an educational series on the budget cycle. And sort of starting tonight, they'll be at the Budget and Revenue Task Force. We'll take it all the way to the approval of town meeting. And as part of that, though, they'd like to interview people, you know, with various aspects about the budget. Uh, so this is just sort of a, a heads up that uh, there may be a time when you might get an, an, 
uh, working with them to, to coordinate that. So you may be getting an email from me sometime asking to set up an interview with Sarah uh, at the studio or somewhere else to explain, you know, your part of, you know, your specialty in the budget and things like that. So at some point they'll be go together. They'll take clips from these recordings that they're doing now, uh, and it should be pretty good. So that's just a heads up. Okay, step in further budget transparency. Yes. Okay. Uh, so just to let you know, uh, Alan could be getting a hold of you. Of course, it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Uh, uh, but it sounds like a good idea overall. Um, budget and Revenue Task Force. Do we have a new date? So we're looking at February 23rd. Uh, I just need to confirm with a few more folks, and then we'll post it uh, on Monday, February 23rd. <coughs> Okay, and that's uh, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, excuse me, the Lions hearing. The Lions hearing room, okay. Uh, again, uh, we have several representatives on it, uh, but everybody, it's an open meeting, and uh, a lot of school committee and other selectmen are there. I, I invite you to uh, come and watch. I mean, uh, we'll be uh, focusing on the long-term plan, uh, and also our reps and senators usually uh, are there. Uh, and local aid is usually a, a topic of discussion. So uh, you, you all are invited, and we'll confirm that a, a definite confirmation. Next day. So. Okay, sure. Okay, one issue that I was going to bring up is uh, uh, obviously we lost Monday because of the uh, uh, weather. Generally speaking, if there is a parking ban, there's no place for us to park, and so we don't have a meeting. So uh, that, that's sort of a quick determinant. Um, on that. Um, if we lose, you know, one or two more days, uh, then things start to get a little concerning. Uh, one thing we could do is meet on Washington's birthday. I don't know if there's any particular prohibition against that. Uh, the other thing we could do, and we used to do in the old days, uh, is meet on a Saturday. So if we pick the second or third or something like that Saturday in March, <coughs> Gloria brings uh, lots of coffee and muffins from Dunkin' Donuts, and uh, we get cranking at 8 o'clock and work until uh, 1 or 2, and uh, she'll bring in some lunch, and uh, we can get a lot of work done, you know, just sitting down and getting it done. So what I'd like you to do is sort of think about it, look at your mark schedule, and to see if something like that, uh, you know, might work for you. Uh, and then we could discuss it at a, uh, at a future meeting. Um, okay. Uh, Stephen? Ah, come on up. Come on up. Thanks, Ken. Is the bottle brush? All in favor? Yeah, plenty of time. Two seconds now. Whatever you need. Right here. Thank you. Okay, now this was uh, uh, originally scheduled again for Monday, and uh, I sent the memo from Stephen out to everybody. Uh, requesting a reserve fund transfer of uh, twenty thousand um, uh, dollars to initiate uh, RFP uh, for an IT consultant on the collection software uh, in the uh, treasurer's office. So, with that, uh, Stephen, anybody else wants to chime in? You know that that'd be good. But why don't you give a brief overview of the purpose of this and what you hope to accomplish? All right. Uh, what was a long-term strategy is now becoming short-term uh, and, and closer by the month. Uh, we intend to uh, move forward with looking at replacing uh, the town's integrated collection system, which is a combination of our collection system for all our tax and utility bills, as well as a cash management system. Uh, there are, uh, have been sitting down with uh, quite a number of people uh, town manager in particular, chairman of the capital planning committee, uh, as well as a host of others, the chief technology officer for the town. Uh, we all have our own particular interests. Uh, we all have our own biases one way or another. The uh, goal of hiring a consultant is to have a level playing field to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks that we do a scope of work uh, study to make sure that uh, we're doing a, a good needs analysis. Uh, a draft scope of work has been done and has already been, been in, 
shared with the town manager as well as uh, three uh, consultants who are in this kind of work. Uh, the goal is that by having a review and analysis of our current operation as well as looking at the needs of the town as a whole uh, and in doing our best to employ best practices, uh, we believe that having a consultant uh, with an expense of $20,000 will enable us to um, sort of step off the line when we issue an RFP for a new collection system. And that's really what the purpose of this is, is to make sure that we've, we've done our needs analysis uh, and we've lined up our ducks properly. Um, by getting the transfer now, if, this, if the Finance Committee moves to grant the transfer, that will give us a leg up on what could be an extended 18-month process without the transfer. Uh, if we were to wait for uh, a budgetary vote in the spring, if we were to wait for a capital planning vote in the spring, uh, we know that with the way that Warren Articles approved, the way the budget takes form, uh, we would lose July and August. We would not be able to begin the process until sometime in the fall, and that just pushes the whole scenario out. Um, my goal, and I think it's Adams as well, is to move the process along um, as expeditiously as possible. Uh, not, um, we want to do it once, we want to do it right. Um, I'll share with you, you know, some anecdotal comments from other treasurers that I've talked to over the last several months. Uh, several towns have made changes uh, and immediately stopped what they were doing, reverted back to older software and applications because they didn't take the proper steps up front to make sure that their needs were met or that implementation issues were discussed well in advance. That's what the purpose of this $20,000 is, is to set ourselves up in a good place so that as we move forward to replace the collection system, we do it right. Um, I want to emphasize that our collection system is not broken. It works fine. But my intent specifically is to mitigate risk. It is using an operating system that uh, is having uh, support from IBM, uh, Wayne, uh, we want to uh, be able to preclude having an issue should there be some problems with the operating system or the background databases. Support going forward will continue to become um, more strenuous and we want to avoid that. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Or actually, Adam, if you'd like to add anything, please do. We've talked about this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Questions? When? Uh, are most of the replacements likely to be cloud-based systems? Are they likely to, are they to be what? Are they cloud-based software as a service system, or that are they like, are they in-house? No, this, uh, well, I, I can't answer the question uh, uh, definitively. Um, that's something that we'll have to investigate and take a look at. Um, there are pros and cons with a cloud-based system. Um, you know, you can say it, it, it's not housed internally. Um, there could be liability issues. There could be security issues. Um, sitting here now, I would prefer a system that's managed in-house. But again, we have to look and see uh, who the, the vendors are, who the service providers are, and how they provide that service. We're not only looking at, we not only need to take a look at the methods of operation, but the support, the logistics, and the cost. Okay, uh, Carolyn and then Alan. No, does not. This is in addition, right. This, we did not request this in our budget. So this is, this is in addition. And you anticipated wanting to do this at some point? Yes. We've always anticipated wanting to do this. We've, we've had these discussions going on for over a year. And we're trying to find the best way to get it done as expeditiously and as effectively as possible. Alan? $20,000 actually doesn't go very far, so I'm, I'm, what I'm encouraging and I'm, I'm consulting, so I'm, you know, assuming and encouraging is that this consultant will act the way the master planning consultants say to, to uh, help organize and uh, focus a group of, you know, this town is filled with IT experts who are willing to contribute time to do that. So I can see a consultant coming in to reach out to the community, get get the people who really know what they're doing to, to put together a much larger plan. You know, really, it's a really, 
value. It's a really efficient way to spend consulting money is to use the resources we have in the town. And I think other you know, groups have, have done that very effectively. So I guess it's an encouragement, maybe a question. Is that your plan? Well, I'll, to be blunt, we had wanted to ask for more than $20,000. We settled on the $20,000. And in talking with some consultants, it's actually a $30,000, a minimum of a $30,000 um, project. Uh, but in talking with uh, three various consultants that we know are in the business, we said, look, we're going to help define uh, the scope of work and focus on the parameters of the work to be done. Um, we're always looking for uh, valuable input, but we're not doing this with a, a goal of creating a volunteer committee. Uh, but I'm not saying we wouldn't look at expertise in the community to help us along that line. Well, for example, ITAC exists, and, and they, they should certainly be part of the, the process. There's some very, very smart people. On right, ITAC. absolutely. Don't disagree with you at all. Okay, are there any other questions for the treasurer? Paul? Um, the ultimate decision on buying the package, that would be a good decision? Ultimately, that would be my decision. However, um, please keep in mind that um, the chief technology officer of the town, the IT director, is involved with this. Um, the town manager's office is involved with this. We have to, as I said earlier, uh, we have to look at what are the technical requirements, what's in the best interest of the town operationally, what's the cost, and what's, what's the impact going to be. We, we also have to worry about how to implement this. We also have to look at what our ongoing support is. So we're certainly not, the treasurer's office is certainly not looking at that um, in a closed environment. And, and will there be, would it require a capital budget item probably to, to pay for it? Yes, there, there will be a capital budget item to replace it, and it is in the capital plan um, now. In fact, um, unless Mr. Foskett wishes to correct me, um, the timeline has been moved up a year sooner. To that point, Paul, I think it's important to mention that the comptroller and the assessor's office will also play a large role in this because integrating whatever is chosen with the existing systems that the assessors use and that the comptroller uses is going to be critical to the success of this as well. Okay, is there anybody else? Alan? Okay, just addressing that point, cloud-based services typically are more by subscription, which become you know, predominantly operating budget. License purchases tend to be more capital budget, so I think you know, depending on which way it goes, could determine whether it's really a capital or whether it's an operating expense. Right. Okay. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Okay. Do I have a motion? So, second. Okay. Motion has been moved and seconded for twenty thousand uh, dollars to the treasurer's budget. Um, any further discussion? I will say, um, I, I do want to say that I wholeheartedly support this. Um, we've talked about this often on as a committee for years. I think one of the challenges um, that always gets faced in this is it's easy to sit in a room as a volunteer finance community member and sort of have a high and mighty, including myself, have a high and mighty opinion of what the people have to show up and work 40, 50 hours a week and do the job every week have to do to keep the system working. You know, it's not just about, you know, this process isn't about shutting down the existing system, not having a treasurer's operation for three months and then standing up a new one. This is about standing up a new one while continuing the existing um, financial structure. And, and, and beyond that, I think anybody that's ever implemented a financial system always has heard the line, you know, measure twice, cut once. You know, because like Steve said, the worst thing you can do is get down the path of putting one of these systems in and you realize that you should have done a workflow diagram to uh, truly understand how the work moves around the department, and then you say, oh shoot, this was the wrong idea. So I, I do commend the treasurer for um, endeavoring down this. We've talked about this for a while. I, I wholly support it. I know he definitely feels that this is the right time to, to go for it. I think he feels this. I mean, I know we have one discussion. I know he feels like his staff well, is one. in the right place. He's got the right team. One thing I think a lot of us <coughs> forget about, and it's easy to forget about it, we, you didn't have an assistant treasurer for a couple of years. It's not that easy to do something. So I think this is the right time. I, I do fully support this as a reserve fund transfer, and I hope you all support it as well. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor uh, of the 20000 reserve fund transfer, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. 
thank you very much. I thank the committee very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your support, and I will keep you all posted. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. Okay. Um, long range financial plan. Right in? You're in. All right. Okay, so take your. So. Let me, let me first say, I want to commend the two new members for not getting up and leaving when the chairman said you might have to work Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that wasn't in the post. It, it was the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so um, last time we met, I believe, was back in September, which uh, at that point we focused on this long range financial projection. Since then, the long range planning committee met. Uh, four times, uh, it's about four times since then, focusing on the plan, focusing on making the plan more accurate as a predictor in some areas, trying to squeeze down expenditures in other areas, uh, while also trying to balance the, uh, really, the, the, the needs and expectations of the residents and citizens from what they'd get from town and school services. So very quickly, let me just start uh, a little differently than I normally do. So the top of the sheet across just about a third of the way down is revenue. Then you'll see appropriations or expenses go down to just about the bottom third. We then carry reserve fund balances, which has free cash, <coughs> long-term stabilization, override stabilization, the zeroed out tip fee stabilization and our municipal building trust fund. And then at the very bottom, you can see the numbers that we're using year over year and then cumulatively based on the school department's projections for enrollment growth. And I, I think it's important to point that out at the outset because there's several numbers in both the revenues and the expenses that are driven by those enrollment projections at the bottom. So any, any questions about the sections? All right, so starting at the top, if we look at revenue, uh, we start with state aid. And nothing's changed about state aid since, we've, uh, <coughs> since we last spoke, uh, other than updating the school enrollment assumption. So we assume 1% on unrestricted general government aid. And then we assume that we're going to get $1,500 increase in Chapter 70 per new student based on the enrollment growth. And that's where you get a differenting percentage growth year over year across the budget. Um, now, in FY16, I think you've probably all heard the governor came in to a very large budget deficit in FY15. He offered a plan just today uh, to close that, uh, or actually maybe late yesterday. Um, and also that, that foreshadows challenges in FY16. However, uh, he's come out very strongly uh, ha having no hesitancy about not cutting local aid in FY15 and the new Secretary of Administration and Finance uh, was comfortable at last week or the week before his MMA annual meeting stating that assuming at least level funding for unrestricted general, general government aid would be a safe assumption. Uh, so sitting here today, given the, uh, the tenor that the, the governor has struck, I didn't feel compelled to change that number today. That budget should be out by March 4th, so really within a month's time we'll know better what to do in that area. Uh, moving down from there, you see school construction aid. I believe uh, Andrew talked about the last time we came together. We realized that, uh, was it 2006? 2006. 2006. Uh, in 2006, um, the MSBA shorted us in money they owed us. Uh, so the treasurer, Andrew, and the MSBA sort of together figured that out this year. Uh, so this particular year, we're receiving more than we were budgeted for prior. Then the next two years, we receive that same $2.4 million amount. Uh, and then it starts to fall off, you can see, going down to 1.6 and then 476. And that corresponds <coughs> with the debt service rolling off. Basically, the MSBA every year matches their portion of the debt service for the elementary schools that we built. Uh, and as that debt rolls off, 
their reimbursements roll off. So that's how you see that number begin to diminish over the course of the plan. Moving down to there, uh, from there, you see local receipts. Uh, one thing that's happened since we last met is we set a tax rate. And when we set a tax rate, we go through what's called the recap process. And, and actually, that's why you see uh, the top of that column is FY15 recap. Uh, that numbers are changed, uh, or some of the numbers are changed during recap as the budget is finalized. Uh, so one thing you can do um, if certain things in terms of new growth come in more beneficial uh, than you had budgeted, you can reduce the amount of local receipts you expect. So for the recap in FY15, you can see that local receipts is 8.5 million. We had previously budgeted 8.8, um, .8, actually 8.85, I believe. Uh, so we reduced that. Uh, any collections over that will automatically roll into the available free cash balance for next year. Then going forward, you can see that uh, we bump it back up to 8896, and then year over year, a $75,000 increase. There's a few things happening there. For one, we lowered it for the recap, but we still have our assumptions of what a stable budget will be for local receipts. So for FY16, we project back up adding a, uh, a $75,000 increment to what the last year's budget would have been before the recap for local receipts. And the reason we went up to $75,000, you may recall it used to be a $50,000 increment on local receipts, is um, our revenue working group, which consists of uh, myself, the deputy town manager, chairman of the finance committee, uh, the treasurer, um, am I forgetting anybody, and the, uh, and the assessor, uh, met. We, we really took a close look at local receipts, saw that we, we had a, a certain degree of confidence based on our prior year's collection that we could bump up our expectations. Um, the lion's share of local receipts is motor vehicle excise tax. That's very sensitive to economic shifts. So if we had a down economy, uh, we could substantially lose motor vehicle excise. Uh, so we weren't comfortable bumping up that increment each year much more uh, than 75000 or more at all than 75000 But that does represent an increase in projected revenue from the last time we sat down and took a look at this plan as the Finance Committee. Moving from there, you can see free cash. The policy uh, since I've been here has been to appropriate 50% of the prior year's certified free cash as an operating revenue. So you can see in FY15, that $3 million figure was half of what was certified last year. And then in FY16, we're pro uh, projecting to use $3.4 million, which is half of, if you go back down to that reserve balance portion of the sheet I mentioned, half of the $6.8 million certified number in FY15. Now one thing that came out of the long-range planning discussions was increasing how we project free cash beyond FY15. And we decided that using a 10-year historical average of certified free cash as our estimated free cash on the bottom of the sheet would be a more accurate predictor of what free cash might be. So you can see along the bottom we're carrying a figure of 3.9. That's the today's retrospective 10-year average free cash figure. So up above FY17 and beyond, you see 50% of that going forward. Below that, we have the overlay reserve surplus. That's money that the Board of Assessors declares surplus after they go through their abatements and see what's available from prior year overlay that's set aside. In FY15, they declared $250,000 surplus. Um, in the past, we'd been projecting $200,000 a year. We don't have a new projected surplus number from them today. Uh, so we will uh, continue to carry 200 when they give us a new number. If it is a new number, uh, we'll adjust accordingly. Below that, <coughs> you have really the lion's share of the revenue in property tax. Contained in property tax is 2.5% increase in the levy, an estimated $450,000 in new growth, uh, and there's also the MWRA debt shift contained in there as well as debt exclusions that are being raised. Uh, one important key thing to mention is in FY15, we had budgeted $450,000 for new growth, uh, but the number came in at approximately $1.2 million. We, uh, we also took a pretty close look at new growth and whether or not we should be upping our estimates for new growth on a go-forward basis. But the 10-year uh, retrospective average for new growth was $650,000. And we didn't feel compelled, uh, based on that number, and, and uh, based on the volatility of new growth, to bump the 450. Uh, we've tried, through the long-range planning discussions and through that revenue working group, to maintain some uh, conservatism 
in our estimates while also trying to make certain lines more accurate based on past performance. So do you want to stop at revenues and see if there's any questions? Are there any questions from the manager on revenues? Well, on the, the free cash thing again, so <coughs> it took the 10-year average of free cash, or uh, how much was contributed to free cash for each year? 10 years certified amount, so the amount that the <coughs> Department of Revenue certified. If, if we're adding it to what was budgeted from the previous year, is, isn't that sort of six of one and half the other? Um, well, well, for instance, just looking at the difference between FY, what you have for free cash for FY15 and, and FY16, you're going to be starting with free cash of $3.4 million. And you're saying, well, we're only going to add 500000 to that this year. And then effectively in the future years, you're adding, you're saying there's going to be, uh, you know, $1.9 million added to it each year. So what you've predicted for this coming year is significantly different than what you're predicting for the outgo outlying years. So the, the, the past approach was just throw a dart at a board and pick a number right. and estimate it at the bottom. <laughs> okay, so we used to carry, when I first started working in Arlington, we carried $1.5 million. Then we bumped it to two million. Then we bumped it, I think, from two million to three million, w with really no analysis at all. Um, the discussions of the long-range planning committee, uh, which, frankly, I I am not an initial supporter of even going to this ten-year average because I think there is risk involved with that. I think does add a new layer of analysis we've not performed before for free cash. That that's my feeling. I think the. Uh We've taken some of the conservatism out of the, this. Uh, that's probably one of the things that's left a little bit. Because uh, you hit a recession, and the treasurer will be the first one to tell you what happens to motor vehicle excise, what happens to investment income. and uh, uh, So it's, it's based on an analysis, yet it's still maybe a little bit conservative compared to what happened the last couple of years. Maybe not before. Dean? The only thing I would point up on Paul's question to, on, on free cash. The only two things I would, I guess, suggest looking at is first, I understand you're taking a 10 year average, but you're taking a 10 year average on a budget that has two factors going on. One, it gets bigger every year. And two, we work on this budget model where we have this big override with a surplus and we sort of build up the reserve and then we, we go down, right? Um, so I think the only concern I would have with doing a 10 year average, or the concern I would have with doing a 10 year average is first question I would ask is, have we looked at, and if we didn't, maybe we should, is look at free cash as a percentage of the overall budget. So as the budget's going up, is, you know, we might say that, hey, you know, this number gets bigger and bigger, but is it getting bigger as a percentage of the budget? So are we always returning, and I'm just making this up, are we always returning 2% of the budget back? So that might be sort of, a, I think, a, a worthwhile data point financially. Second question I would have, and this would be the more concerning part of it, is I've never really looked at how free cash works as we build up a surplus and then the budget gets tighter as we spend. Because the other concern I would have is um, that 10-year average just could have totally smoothed out volatility. So in year one after an override, you might have a decent free cash number. It could be 3% of the overall operating budget. It could be a big number. As we get through, you know, going back to 06, year two, three, four, five, that night number could have tightened. And so what we do when we model it out like this is in the early years, the actual number might come in conceivably under that sort of thought process. The early numbers could come in with say, oh, we're beating expectations. Look, we, you know, we put 1.9, we got 2.5, great. You know, see, perfect. Then you get to the out year when the budget starts tightening and you put 1.9 in and you get 1.2. And you say, oh, bleep, that's a problem. That would, be my, that would be my bigger concern is if we're not looking at the actual correlation over the different years and just taking an average on those two factors, you don't really get caught in 2016. You get caught out in 2018 or 19. You run out of money much quicker than you expected. 
So you're more articulately making the argument that I've tried to make in the past as to why we shouldn't increase the amount of free cash that we uh, budget at the bottom. But I will say, what we are doing here, I think will actually still achieve the outcome that you're looking for. We're gonna, we will, uh, with, with barring a, an economic downturn very soon, we will do better than those estimates at the bottom. I'm, I'm fairly confident that we will. And we may not do better than those estimates at the bottom as the plan goes out. But the smoothing effect in the estimate, I think, <coughs> will also have the smoothing effect in the revenue impacts over the course of the plan. Okay. Okay, is there any other questions on the revenues? Alan, over to Charlie. Coming up with what Dean said, I think this, this sort of flat projection that's, you know, there's no, there's no growth in here, and we know budgets grow, is certainly much more conservative than a straight line approximation that you know, considers the average change over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. so I think there's, there's that conservatism built into this, which I think is a good thing. Where is the um, Community Preservation Act tax collection shown? So we, we've not collected any community preservation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, th I think that that's a discussion yet to happen as to how we're going to uh, include that in the long range plan if we're going to. But don't we have to raise that tax in the fiscal year 2017? 2016. 16. The FY16, yeah. FY16. So it's not shown on. What I'm trying to understand is how we can get a two, two and a half percent increase in taxes when we have a one and a half percent increase in the community preservation. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, a, it's a fair question. Because we're going to find out that our taxes are going up three and a half to four percent or more. Yeah, we'll have to look at it. I mean, the, the challenging part will be community preservation taxes raised aren't expense every year. The community preservation committee isn't going to have to recommend the full expenditure. Can so, I have them? just a little louder. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, uh, elderly. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the community preservation taxes aren't they're, they're they're collected every year, but they're not automatically expended every year. So we'll have to decide how we want to represent. You know, perhaps perhaps it's well, it can be appropriated into a fund. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But but the but the point is. Taxes are going to be collected. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. And they're not on here. I mean, of course, it depends on how many more lines you want to add to this. Well, I suppose you could include uh, under E that total, <coughs> and then someplace down under J, K, L, M uh, could be Community Preservation Act fund or something like that. Yeah, I, you know, my concern would be. It, it, it's sort of an objectives question of what 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 are we tr what are we trying to do with this document? You know, if if we are trying to just encompass in that line the total tax dollars collected, then you're right. But if we're just trying to get at the long-term structural deficit and the year-over-year -year general fund balancing, I, I'm not sure if we're achieving that objective by including the CPA figures. I, I feel I, I can see both sides of it. So well, you can make the same comment about um, about the. Uh, Exempt debt that's financing a school budget. That I mean that, that those exempt that's true. taxes are they hit the taxpayer and they yeah. serve as debt, but they're not you know part of the general uh, yeah. expense fund. Yeah, no, that that is a fair point. So I, mean, I just think we have to treat everything yeah. consistently. And I, and I and I would hate to have somebody like the chairman of the finance committee or the town manager asked the town meeting why the taxes are one and a half percent lower than they actually are. That would be not a good question to have. Yeah, asked. so that's a, it's a fair, fair consideration. Alan? I think there's another major uncertainty in how to manage the CPA in that if you, one way to slice the CPA revenues is this is money that would be spent on what's already in the budget, and there's another pile of money that would be spent on things that are not already in the budget. And how you know where that line falls is sort of dependent on the results of the community preservation committee that that recommends use of those funds. So if if all of the new money was not included in these expenditures, then it, you have the same number on both sides, and it's a wash. There was if, if all of the CPA revenues were spent on things that aren't in the budget now, then it's sort of off the off the table. If there's some dividing line that's not zero hundred then some would be merged in here. But until we know that proportion, it's really hard to build it into the model. Except you can put it in a fund. 
you can yeah, put you know, we, we, you can just we've offset. got things like offset aid. You know, where <coughs> basically money coming in under state aid but goes to a separate item. So, you know, we could take the property tax, simply add in the CPA uh, projected amount, and then fit in an M for a CPA fund. And so you you built it in, yeah. and the uh, taxes will go up instead of 2.72. It'll go up whatever it goes up. Now, when does the CPA take effect? Is it is it is it July one? It's for the new. July 1, and it'll and officially be set uh, with the FY16 tax rate. Yeah. But it will be estimated on the uh, Okay, and that months. money will go into a fund because nothing will be spent until the following July 1. Correct. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions, Len? Um, so I appreciate all the changes you've made, and, and uh, just two comments. One is that the, you know, part of the reason the free cash we're seeing such a high free cash is because the plan is conservative. So we're seeing lower medical rates and higher local receipts and higher um, uh, higher new growth, all of that is flowing into free cash. Probably could have seven million or more this year as a result of all those things going on. So as those as the plan becomes slightly less conservative, free cash might go down a little bit, but you're right, I think the 10 year has moved it out, so we'll be okay. The one question I did have, um, again, that, that we've talked about is, is local receipts. And normally at some point you do uh, sort of sort of uh, recap that with what actually has occurred, not just the 75 over what was in the budget last year, but taking a real look at what, what the local receipts that came in last year, what the anomalies were. You know, we're, we're halfway into to fiscal year 15. We have some, uh, pro probably a good idea of what the real yes. local yes, receipts right. are. So is there a plan to, to take a look at that and catch up the number? Because I, th I still think it's much lower than reality. So I, I still feel like, so we, we, we monitor it monthly. Uh, we monitor every single possible area that you can collect <coughs> the local receipt mm -hmm. in monthly. Um, I still feel that as part of the overall plan, pumping that number up too high given the volatility of motor vehicle excise tax is, is risky. That, that, that's, how I, that's how I look at it. You know, um, rough numbers, I, I don't have the sheet in front of me, but at the last dip, I think we went from about four million collected in motor vehicle excise down to almost 3.5 in, in one year. So that, that's a pretty significant percentage dip in collections. So I, I wouldn't want to leave the plan. But that occurred two or three years after the start of the recession. Uh, probably two, yeah. So, yeah. So I mean, but I think we can. I, I think we can be a little more aggressive there, and still, if there's another recession and car sales suddenly dry up, make the adjustments in the long range plan accordingly. Well, you can make them accordingly, but the, then the bottom line number you have in that last year will get will get bumped forward. I just I, I get very uncomfortable presenting, and things can change no matter how much we shape and, and smooth this. I get very uncomfortable putting us in a position where I think we are going to have to promise less than we've put out to the voters. We've been collectively all very successful in keeping that bar going out further and further. I, I'm, I'm very sensitive to putting us in a situation where that bar starts slipping slipping back. Yeah, I think my, I just express my preference. My preference would be to see a more realistic local receipts number and a lower free cash exactly. number. So. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Charlie? Yes, I, Adam, uh, <coughs> the, uh, just eyeballing this uh, chart and, you know, I missed the last uh, <coughs> the planning committee meeting. I apologize for that, but um, it looks like the that the tax rate's gone up two and a half percent a year. <coughs> now, ap apart from my question, you know, close to two and a half percent a year. Yeah. Apart from my question about the the um, CPA tax, uh, if you look at the town, your report, the town manager, you know, that nice book you put out, <coughs> the annual report yeah. or the, the financial plan. Well, both of them. No. Both of them. They have some common good. data. Award winning. Award the award winning book. That's the one with the nice <laughs> fancy cover. <laughs> Um, the la in, in your own report, the last five years, the taxes have gone up on the average 4.7% 4, 4 a year cumulative. The Boston Globe, with some numbers from the state, reported that they went up a little bit over 5%. I uh, can't remember if it was the same, exact same overlapping years. So I don't understand how we can be forecasting a 2.5% tax increase every year when, in fact, the taxes have been gone up, have gone up 5%. What, what chart is, uh, is that? Uh, it's in your, you know the page where you show the single family 
tax rates and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different places you can extract it, but it's 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 gone up more than two and a half percent a year. And and the reason, you know, one of the reasons that I think it's gone up is because the the um, you know we put we built the Thompson School, for example, which is exempt taxes. Yeah. Um, and there may be other things like that. I'm not sure. So um, we are going to rebuild the Stratton, and that's going to some of that is going to hit the yeah. exempt tax rate. Is that that probably is not in here? That is that is not uh, assumed in here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just suggesting that we what we're projecting here is essentially a drop in the rate of tax growth that we haven't experienced for more than five years. Yeah, I'm perplexed. I, I get, we got to. I got to. You got to show me which one. Is it? Did you look at it and do the math out the five percent, or we're I showing did. five? I looked at it. I did the math. Boston Globe did the math. So it's got to be based on the override. Mm -hmm. That's the. That's got to be the number. So that that is a very. That's probably in there too. The override probably. So you in put there the too. override up here, and then because yeah. that year it would have gone up twelve and a half percent. Whatever. Yeah. In in any event, there's a five over a five year period. There's a five percent annual. Well, so I I bristle a little at sort of pointing this out as being inaccurate. It is going up. Inaccurate? Well, I mean, it's two and a half percent a year going forward. I mean, that's not. I don't think that's sort of a misleading number. No, no, I'm not saying it's misleading. I'm just saying that. I'm just trying to understand what the. What the difference is, if you you know if you've looked at the history and you yeah. look at where we're going, and one thing that jumps out at me is there's going to be some impact from the strat. From the strat there may be yeah. some impact from a high school, yeah. uh, maybe from Minuteman, an and um, <coughs> we should be considering those. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. I, so I'll take a look at. It. I'd be fairly certain that that percentage that you're talking about was <coughs> driven by the override. Could be. Could be right. Um, the Stratton figure uh, should be included in. All, you know, sort of historically, we've been si we continue to caveat high school minimum, high school minimum, you know, unknown, timing unknown, yeah. amount yeah. unknown, have to know it's going to have an impact on it. And we have, mo right. and we have modeled um, the impact of those, those projects yeah. based on uh, actual costs or projected yeah, costs. Yeah, assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions on revenues? Expenditures. All right. So one of the key focuses of the Long Range <coughs> Planning Committee's discussions was looking at what we could do to curb year-over-year <coughs> -year growth, primarily in town and school operating budgets, but also in some of the other uh, op some of the other operating budgets as well. Uh, so we we probably ran twenty to thirty <coughs> different versions of this plan with the Long Range Planning Committee, taking different cuts at different approaches to see where we'd get. Um, some of those cuts uh, looked at different free cash options, uh, as we've already talked about. Um, and for education, uh, for uh, town and school, we, we talked about the three and a half and seven for general ed and special ed, and then the three and a half for town growth, and seeing what it would look like if we went to Three and a quarter percent, three percent, two and a half percent, and looked at what impacts that had on the life of this long-range plan. Uh, after a great deal of back and forth on mem uh, by members of the of the long-range planning committee, um, I came back with the recommendation that is what you saw in the uh, the budget I submitted as well as here for FY sixteen. Uh, what we're proposing for the school department is retaining the 3.5% for FY16 for general ed, the 7% for special education, flatline, continuing the flatline, that kindergarten fee offset that you see here, as well as continuing the computation of the enrollment growth factor, which just like the state aid correlates to the projected enrollment growth at the bottom of the sheet, except in that instance, we multiply it by 25% of DESEs per pupil expenditure. So for FY16, that would be the number of students multiplied by $3,136.50. However, going into FY17, we proposed that the 3.5 for general ed goes down to three and a quarter, and then in FY18 <coughs> and beyond, go from three and a quarter down to 3%. Now, we've, we've not found an easy, accurate, convenient way 
to demonstrate the three and a half, three and a quarter, three, 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 because of the compounding effect of the growth factor in the way that this spreadsheet demonstrates the total school budget. Um, but you can see, uh, well, I guess if you compared it to the, the, the last version of the plan, you would see a reduction in overall projected school spending year over year based on that three and a half, three and a quarter, three here on out. <clears throat> Moving down from school, you see Minuteman. Now this uh, Minuteman line is actually the only line that's changed since we sent out uh, these books a couple weeks ago. Uh, we got an updated uh, estimated appropriation for a Minuteman. Went down by just about $100,000. Uh, so you see this year, uh, we're looking at, that's my line, uh, just, a, just below a 6% increase in Minuteman's um, projected assessment. And then we continue to assume 3.5% growth in Minuteman's assessment over time. Going down below that, if you look at net town budget, so the proposal that I had put before the Long Range Planning Committee was that in FY16, the town's rate of expenditure go down to three and a quarter. And then in FY17 and beyond, the town's rate of expenditure growth go down to 3%. <clears throat> so the budget we submitted uh, came in at a 2.95% uh, growth. And then you can see it carried, uh, as an estimate, as 3% across. <coughs> Excuse me. Below that line, you can see we carry the MWRI debt shift. That's the money I mentioned earlier that's raised on the tax rate that goes directly to the water and sewer enterprise fund to offset water sewer bills. <coughs> Below that, we have the capital budget. From FY16 to FY20, we have what is contained in the Capital Planning Committee's expected recommendation. Uh, to town meeting. There may be some small changes between now and then. And then in FY21, uh, we have an estimation of what, um, uh, probably a, a conservatively low estimation of what the capital budget could look like in FY21. Uh, Moving down from there, pensions. Uh, this is a change since we last met. Uh, myself, uh, Mr. Foskett, met with the retirement board, uh, as along with Carolyn White as well, asking that they consider reducing their rate of growth, which had been 6% <coughs> a year, down to 5.5%. Uh, ultimately, we came to an agreement on that. Uh, what you can see going to FY16 is a 5.75% growth. That's based on the way we calculate offsets. They gave us an appropriation number that was only 5.5% higher. The way we calculate offsets, <coughs> sort of came out at 5.75%, uh, it will regulate in years going forward so that we have year over year 5.5% growth um, in pensions. Insurance, when, uh, this is another change since we last met. As the plan had been before, we carried an assumption that insurance would go up by 7% a year. <coughs> what we uh, did through discussing with the Long Range Planning Committee is we took a uh, look at the 10-year historical average of premium increases for the GIC and saw that the historical 10-year average is 5.25%. So what we have for insurance is an estimate that rates will go up by 5 and a quarter percent and then an assumption that we will be hiring some number of new teachers based on that enrollment growth factor. We then factor them in to the insurance based on a number of contracts uh, or assume the new contracts split between individual <coughs> and family plans and then we estimate going forward. And that's, what, that's why you see the number go up by a different amount each year, which is slightly higher than the five and a quarter percent. <clears throat> now one thing I want to mention is two days after, um, after this budget was submitted, uh, I received first word from the GIC uh, that they were looking at some trouble for FY16 in terms of setting rates. So then I uh, went to a GIC municipal forum last week and they're looking at some options. They're looking at if they uh, do nothing else other than change premiums, they would be increasing premiums by a weighted average of 9.5%. If they changed their PPO offering, their Harvard uh, and Tufts PPO offerings, the POS plans, uh, it changes the manner in which you would need to get a referral if you were in one of those plans, basically. Um, they'd be able to bring down that premium increase to 8.5%. Uh, 
They're also considering making some plan design changes, uh, increases in co-pays for prescription drugs, increases in the employee deductibles, increases in specialist co-pays, <coughs> increases in the inpatient hospitalization copay, as well as the outpatient, outpatient surgery copay. None of that is decided upon yet. Uh, if they did those plan design changes, it would bring weighted average, um, weighted average premium growth down to five and a half or uh, five and a half to six and a half percent with their projection. On February 14th, the commission, the actual group insurance commission, will be voting on what to do for plan design changes and whether or not to shift that PPO to a POS plan. And then on March 4th, they'll actually be issuing what their expected FY16 premium rates are. So uh, they held a public hearing today. Uh, I'm not sure, sitting here now, how that public hearing went uh, on all of those changes that I just mentioned. So they have some decisions to make. Um, I have asked for a balanced approach. I think reasonable plan design changes coupled with reasonable premium growth is an acceptable approach for them. They will get uh, some substantial pushback from union members uh, on any changes to plan design. Um, I think. <coughs> With the HRA, the health reimbursement arrangement that we put in place three years ago when we first went into the GIC, which is still adequately funded, we can protect the employees against uh, a significant amount of those proposed <coughs> plan design uh, changes that I mentioned. Uh, but there's still some further discussions and information to learn about what our health insurance rates will be in FY16. So I haven't changed that number for tonight's presentation because I didn't think I could, in an educated manner, do so. Uh, but sometime between now and early March, those numbers will most likely be updated. And Adam, if that increase, I'm assuming there'll be an increase, <coughs> what percentage of that increase will be passed on to the employees? So it depends on the plan, uh, you know, what plan you're in. So HMOs, we pay 20%. PPOs, we pay 15%. Uh, indemnity plans, uh, I'm sorry, the employees pay 20% for HMOs. Um, 15% for uh, PPOs. I'm getting that back. <coughs> no, 20% for PPOs, 15% for HMOs, and 25% for indemnity plans. So that would be their percentage share of a premium increase. So we're still stuck with the. <coughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, the lion's share of it does hit the town. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, unfortunate, well, we can't, we can't change that for retirees because the legislature, uh, in their wisdom last year, they, when they put in the plan, Three years ago, which was which was great, and I think the legislature drew a lot of credit for doing that. But they put a three-year freeze on the ability of the board of selectmen to change the percentages for retirees. Uh, and this last year, they put in another three-year yeah. freeze extension. So <coughs> they've curtailed our ability to change some of that on that. Uh, Carolyn, do you know when the last time the GIC increase was more than? Was seven percent or more right. year over year? Let's look at that sheet. It's been a long time. So it looks like FY ten to FY eleven, the, the weighted premium increase was eight point three. And then you got to go back to FY six, FY seven, and it was seven point three. So it's it's, <coughs> it's typical of insurance. This it's cyclical. About every four years, you see a big bump. So that's the peak, yeah. and then you'll see it drop again. Yeah. Which doesn't mean it won't happen again next year, but I'm not surprised it's about yeah. four years. Yeah, you know, the, um, the executive director uh, of the GIC has set a goal for zero, zero, negative two, negative two, which I think she very sincerely thinks is what it should be mm -hmm. in, in actuality with what the providers are charging and the agreements between the carriers and the providers. That's not happening. Um, but the GIC is, is certainly very focused on containing the cost as much as possible because it impacts all the lo uh, local governments that are in the GIC, but it impacts the state government's budget in a, you know, obviously an incredibly significant way based on, uh, you know, how many state employees are in the GIC. Okay, any other questions, Charlie? Now, <coughs> the one thing that uh, bothers me, and um, I'm not sure how, how we should be addressing it, but the um, the uh, town's actuary put out a report about two months ago on the unfunded 
health insurance liability. And <coughs> you know, this is the this is the case where if you're putting some money into it, it's one level, and if you're yeah. you have to discount it at um, different at percentage. The, 7% or 8%, if you, if you don't put any money in it, you have to discount it at the cost of funds. And I think he, as I recall, he might have picked a, a low number, but not, not all the way down to the cost of funds for a hard calculation. And the unfunded actuarial liability, if that's what it's called, I can't remember. That's what it's called, yeah. It's, <coughs> it's um, isn't it $194 million or yeah. something like that? So we're not carrying that in the health insurance budget, but it's a... Oh, we are, but go ahead. Well, we're not. We're carrying the normal por portion of it. We're, <coughs> carrying, we're not amortizing the unfunded liability. Right. And um, so that's a that's a uh, uh, you know this, what do they call it a generational equity equity issue, yeah. right? Um, and you know we're taking the benefit of the lower GIC costs. But we're leaving that liability hanging out there for the next generation of taxpayers to take care of. And I'm wondering if that's the right thing to do in the context of the long range plan. So I would say, um, I, I agree with you. Um, you. You know, the OPEB issue, or I'm, so Charlie's talking about retiree health insurance, which is often referred to as OPEB, other post employment benefits, which I think is some of the worst branding. <laughs> uh, anybody has ever done because as soon as you say OPEB, everybody <laughs> thinks you're talking about oil producing nations or something. <laughs> um, so, so it's sort of the, the, the practical impact is about 50%, just about 50%, is that right, of that number, of, this, of the insurance number, is retiree health insurance. So, what, what ends up happening is we pay for it every year. So, it's that pay go approach that you probably heard the actuary talking about. But if you go, if you push it out year over year, Every year, it eats up a little bit more of what you can use to deliver services to residents. So even if we didn't fund that liability, eventually it just eats up more and more and more and more until you squeeze where you can no longer provide the services you want to provide without charging a heck of a lot more money. Because the, re because the retiree population keeps growing. Yes, exactly. Okay. exactly. Yes. And the cost of health care. And the cost of health care. From where I sit, I don't think there is any way we can fund our way out of this problem. I think the state has to take action on some form of the recommendations that the OPEP Commission came out with, I think two years ago now, that would really significantly change how public employees accrue their health insurance benefits in, uh, in retirement. And not to go into any great detail, but really what the, the crux of the recommendations of that commission was, earn your health insurance benefits like you earn your pension benefits. So. I, can't, I couldn't retire tomorrow with full pension benefits, but I, with my age I couldn't retire, but with my service I could retire with full health care benefits. That doesn't really make sense if you, if you think about it financially. So what they've talked about is grandfathering certain criteria of people in based on their tenure, and then basically you got to have 30 years in to get your full max health insurance benefit, and you start accruing it at 20 years. So you invest at 20 years, and so let, let's say the, the town's benefit for you as a retiree was 80%. At 20 years, you get 40%. At 25 years, you get 60%. And then at 30 years, that's how you actually get to your 80%. Actuarially, those have dramatic impacts on what the unfunded liability is. So I, I think without, without actions like that, we're all, not, not just Arlington, state and local government is in a big, is in big trouble in terms of funding services. So, it's down in a later line item. You know, we do put money towards it every year. We have about $8 million in an OPEB trust fund, um, but it is a, a mere pittance compared to what, what the unfunded liability is. So what if we were actually budgeting the health insurance budget at 7% and put that difference into the unfunded liability account? In other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, in a sense, we're treating the health insurance benefit from the GIC as a sort of a virtual tax increase or revenue increase for the town. Definitely are. And, um, but it's not, it's not really at the expense of the employees. It's at the expense of future, future taxpayers. 
No, I, I think that's fair. I mean, it, it definitely becomes a choice between the more money you divert somewhere else out of this plan, the sooner that an override has to be considered. Thank you. Yeah, I, I feel like it's not necessarily my role to say when the override should. Uh, <laughs> should no, happen. I just I just pointed it's a big number, yeah. 193 yeah. million dollars. I agree. It's, and it's it's a real number. That's greater than our pension, isn't it? It absolutely it is. is. It's 50% greater than our pension liability. Yep. And we have a defined schedule to retire the pension liability. We have no schedule to retire the uh, retiree pre premium liability. And, and, and Adam is right, you know, if, if the state makes some changes, it'll benefit us. But, you know, Beacon Hill is a very political place, and who knows what can happen. Yep. And the, the caution would be, um, not to sound like I'm on both sides of it, if they made those big changes, they would certainly, at least in some years following, consider making us commit to a schedule like we have for our pension. So we would save our save on our liability, but then would have to really hammer down on some financial planning in terms of making, you know, a real payment every year towards that liability. But we're going to have this liability anyway. Anyway, that's correct. Yeah, that's it, it sort of becomes where did, when does the real hard choice? And, and there's there's a certain amount of sentiment out, out there right now that, you know, any benefit that's happened because of Obamacare has happened and now we're going to get higher health insurance costs. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, and, and retirees are going to live longer, we hope. Yeah. So it's all <laughs> heading in the wrong direction. I, I, I can't disagree. That's what the issue I, I mentioned before, because be, prior to this, the Board of Selectmen had themselves control over the split between the town and retirees. The, the Selectmen could, if they wanted to, go to 50-50. But the legislature, unfortunately, has taken that authority away for another three years. And I, I don't know if we need to go to 50-50, but maybe we should bring everybody at least down to 75-25. <coughs> uh, a little bit more reasonable than 85-15. Well, I will say one promising thing that I just learned this afternoon, there had been a long-standing uh, court case between Somerville and one of their unions about whether or not you were actually required by law to collectively bargain retiree health care percentages uh, and a court ruling just came in today that upheld Somerville's position that they did not have to collectively bargain mm -hmm. retiree health percentages. So from, from a management point of view that was a very, very big victory. Any other questions on the insurance or pensions? Okay. Adam? I think Carolyn had it. No. Well, it, it just that we don't know, we've talked about this on the number of years I've been here and consistently I've heard we don't want to put more money into OPEB because we don't know what the changes will be going forward. And if they are, they will probably be to our benefit. That has been the conversation we've had the last three years um, when we've gotten to the point of deciding whether or not to raise the amount of money we put into that fund. Everything that's been said is true and important. Um, and we do need to keep that in mind going forward whenever we're talking about retiree benefits, that at the moment we're not funding their health insurance um, to what it'll need to be. But you know, your point about any money put into this fund is money that can't be spent on current um, operating needs within the town. Yeah, whether it be in the fund or paying for retiree health insurance. I mean, it's, it's a cost of the operation but it's not directly going to service delivery today. Okay, anybody else? Adam? All right. All right, so <coughs> below insurance, we have state assessments. Uh, that is what shows up on the second page of the cherry sheet we re uh, received from the state. Basically, they give us money in state aid and then take money back from us in the form of state assessments. Uh, the lion's share of that is our contribution to the MBTA. Uh, what we assume is every year that will go up by two and a half percent. Um, I, I believe it's actually legally capped at two and a half percent with some caveats based on proposition two and a half. Below that, also contained on the cherry sheet, is offset aid. That's aid we receive directly goes to library expenditures <coughs> and school lunch expenditures. What we've done uh, is we, we take the number that's on the most recent cherry sheet and then we carry that forward. Uh, it has a slight degree of variation year to year, uh, but it's been the methodology we've used. Below that, we have overlay reserve. That's the money the Board of Assessors 
uh, we'll put aside every year in preparation for abatements <clears throat> in setting the recap. Uh, we were able to do two things based on that higher new growth number I mentioned. Uh, one was lower local receipts, which we discussed. The other was increase what was put aside in overlay reserve. Going forward, every third year we fund overlay reserve at 800,000, and then in the intervening two years we funded at 600,000. So FY16 is one of those third years. And the reason we do it in that third year is because that's a revaluation year where higher, a higher level of abatements are expected. So you see that cycle starting in 16, 8, 6, 6, 8, 6, 6, going across, uh, going across the plan. Below that, we have a line fixed costs, reserve fund, and elections. That is simply, as it's labeled, it's $1 million in the re operating reserve fund. And then the estimated cost of operating town elections every year. We made the decision last year uh, to pull that out of the operating budget because it, based on the number of state elections, it goes up and down every year. So rather than having the town budget be, be the beneficiary, then pen, pen, uh, take a penalty, and then be the beneficiary, and be the, then take a penalty sort of in year over year, we put it as a fixed cost. Under that, we have uh, other, uh, other amounts to be raised, court judgments, deficit, and SIMS. So there's really three things in there. <clears throat> what we have in there, first and foremost, is the exact amount of the SIMS debt to be paid. So that's being raised up top as what that SIMS property is paying in taxes. And then what we actually owe in debt service goes into the Urban Renewal Fund to pay that debt service. <clears throat> and that's represented in that line. Next, we have half a million dollars for a potential snow and ice deficit. So I mentioned that earlier when we were talking about snow and ice deficit spending. That's one of the ways we protect against a deficit. And then we have $100,000 for potential court judgments against the town that would come after the budget process. And then we just carry that number. We carry those the 500 and the 100 across, and then it's the actual debt service payment going across. So you can see that is what creates the variation in the figures. Below that, we have warrant articles. Uh, that's the various articles, uh, boards, committees, commissions, uh, water bodies fund, under other <coughs> sort of miscellaneous warrant articles. The lion's share of that, though, is our contribution to the OPEB uh, trust fund. One difference this year, in past years, what we've con uh, contributed to the OPEB trust fund has been <coughs> the difference between $500,000 and what the actual non-contributory pension uh, allocation is. This year, that's about $400,000 plus $155,000, which is an amount that was locked in some five or six years ago now, I would guess, based on retiree uh, health savings that were achieved based on a shift in contributions. Uh, and then this year, uh, we <coughs> took the difference between <coughs> three and a quarter percent, which was going to be what the town's budget growth uh, was based on the proposal I put before the Long Range Planning Committee. But we came in at 2.95%. So the difference between 2.95 and 3.25, we put into what the proposed OPEB contribution would be uh, for FY16. And then the last line in the plan uh, is the override stabilization fund uh, for appropriations, that is contributions to the override stabilization fund. <coughs> I didn't reference it in revenues, uh, uh, and I should have. Beginning in FY17, we project to stop making deposits into the override stabilization fund and rather start making withdrawals. So you can see, uh, you can either follow at the top with the withdrawals or you can look at the balance at the bottom and watch how the balance goes up and then begins to slowly go down. And then you can see we finally exhaust those override stabilization funds. In FY21, we use the last 839,000 based on this projection. And in that budget year, uh, based on everything we've talked about, would be facing a $10.6 million deficit to cover that year. <coughs> so that's, that's the revenue picture, and that's, uh, this is the, really the picture with only Minuteman being changed since the budget was submitted on January 15th. So I guess this revenue questions, overall questions, whatever is uh, appropriate. Okay, any further questions on the long-term plan? Charlie? Uh, where do you have the, um, the assessor's assessment um, um, 
inspect, you know, their, their... Oh, their actual reval cost, that's reval in the cost. warrant. That's assumed in the warrant. It's just still in the warrant, because yes. they were talking about putting that into their budget. We've had that discussion with them. So, so it's a, a, like a, a set amount every year to do a little bit, is that...? Yeah, some, yeah. Sort, some sort of a budget, but you have it still in the warrant article. Yeah, that's... that's yeah, yeah, do we that's increase it to 50000 considering it's a reval year now? Okay. That, that number may fluctuate a bit, but we'll get down with Paul? Um, for the future, I suggest you can take off the line for TIP the stabilization fund. I think it's I think it's time. I think you're right. Really <laughs> forget about. I think it is time. Okay, I'm missing that. What line is it? It's down under reserve. It's below. Below right. Oh, oh. Yeah. When it says zero. Oh, I see. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. Now, the room for CDA line chart. That's a. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a more <coughs> question for the committee to, to perhaps consider at another meeting. But, you know, based on events in 2008, in the, the previous override stabilization fund, we asked town meeting for a policy that the stabilization fund only be deposited in CD type investments, no stocks. But right now we have 15 million by the end of the year, 18 million sitting around in CDs paying, you know, 0.1 percent. I wonder, given that we don't need the bulk of that money for five years, I wonder whether we should consider the possibility, maybe form a committee, <coughs> to look at possible alternative investments to juice up the return a little bit. I, I believe, and I could go pull out the. 10 page document I wrote when we, as a finance committee, put that before town meeting. We were in a foul mood over investment losses. Mm -hmm. And our, to be quite honest, our might of demanding that was simply echoing state law, which says you can't invest general fund money in anything that's outside of that. And I think it was our sort of nicer way of saying right. that we well, need to get I'm back in line with state law, which we weren't in line with. Yeah, I'd love to see that room. That report. I mean, because I, I do believe there's bond and other investments that. Yeah, they, they, the municipal finance laws are very. I can, I can send it to you. The municipal finance laws are very clear, and it says general fund money can only be expended and can only be put into these highly liquid certain type of instruments. Yep. Um, this type of fund could be in this instrument, and this type of could be that. And we had a. That, yeah, I can pull it up for you, but I think that was sort of our luster at it at the moment. And a lot of times in the past, people <coughs> wondered whether a stabilization fund was really truly a trust fund, or whether it was really just a variation of the general fund. And, and I think DOR, correct me if I'm wrong, has said, you know, it really is a general fund. And if you look in our audits, it's, it's considered in the general fund now, not yes. in the trust funds. Yes. Um, so, so those would be fairly conservative. I, um, and a after all these years of good times, you know, you forget the really bad ones. No. One thing I, I just raised, and I, uh, no particular decision. We've been increasing the stabilization fund by a um, hundred thousand a year, Correct. and that just keeps going up and up and up. And I think, you know, maybe at some time we need to say, well, what's the goal of that fund? Are we trying to get two percent of our total expenditures? Are we trying to say get to three million dollars and leave it at that? Or I have no answer to it. I, I'm just throwing it out to. Uh, I mean, I, I may I sure. Uh, I would say the goal when we started making that hundred thousand dollar contribution, I think, uh, well, it would have been in twelve, I guess, at the at the start of this uh, override plan, was to get us at a position where we'd be at, I think it was five and a half percent of operating revenues as a reserve position, yep. even when we were out of override stabilization funds. So that this is something we looked at. I, I know, in terms of the uh, the rating agencies, that was an important commitment to uphold. Yeah, I agree. It's something that. Every year, we should take a close look at to see if it's the appropriate thing to do. Okay, are there any other questions on the long-term plan? I mean, this is sort of the heart and soul of our financial decision making and going. So, we, everybody here here is to really understand it. And, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Adam and Andrew are both available. If you think of something in the middle of the night, write it down and call them tomorrow. <laughs> Alan and then Charlie. A question. Just to make sure everybody's up to speed, and especially the home audience, could you explain the, the uh, growth factor in the school budget 
where the enrollment numbers come from, how that how that impacts the school budget. Yeah, sure. So why it, why it exists? Yeah, so it that really um, came to be in the FY15 <coughs> uh, last year during long range planning committee discussions, uh, and then budget and revenue task force and finance committee discussions. Uh, the school department uh, presented what was a real substantial growth in the total enrollment of the school department, uh, and we eventually came to an agreement that the override and the, the spending caps in the initial override didn't anticipate a substantial increase in the amount of enrollment in the school department. So if, if you look at the bottom of the sheet, we have FY14-15 in that first area. So in FY15, um, we took the combination of enrollment growth from 14 and 15, which was 281 students, and multiplied it by that 25% of per pupil costs. And, and through the long range planning committee discussions, we just agreed, you know, it's not 100% of per pupil cost because the schools are built, the rooms are being heated, you know, there's a, there's a great degree of fixed cost. So we, we drew a line in the sand at 25% of per pupil cost by DESC. It's a third party number <coughs> that's set, it's easy to find, it's easy to authenticate, uh, and it's an easy number for us to sort of understand the math about to build into the budget. Uh, so then what we started doing was taking that multiplication, uh, including it as a separate factor uh, in the budget. So in FY15, it was $885,000. Now in FY16, and going forward, the school department does enrollment uh, projections based primarily on live births, uh, live births data, uh, and they project out how many students they think will be in the district. And that's what's carried across the bottom of the plan. And then that math is done for every year. We do the math <coughs> based on this year's 25% number, but that 25% of per people costs figure will change, uh, you know, a little bit. It went down this year, but will uh, change a little bit year over year. Um, so that has ended up, you know, changing the total school budget growth <coughs> from what had been about, well, I think it was about four and a half, four point seven percent, up to uh, you know upwards of five percent almost every year in the plan uh, to sort of acknowledge that need of uh, enrollment growth. And it can work both ways. If, if, if sometime in the future there's a decrease in enrollment. <coughs> we would reduce by reduce that proportionate by amount, correct. Okay, Charlie? So, uh, forgive me, I'm not trying to be negative. <laughs> but I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in fiscal year 2021, yes. we're looking at a $10.6 million deficit. So, and the and the tax revenue, the tax base is 123 million in that year. Is that right? That, that is right. So, if we were to have a an override that was going to stabilize the town for three years, and this is without Minuteman or high school or anything like that, um, we would need something on the order of 35 million dollars as an override. Is that right? Um, no. Uh, it, w w when you add an override uh, in, you know, you, you you put it in there, and then it, it's there and raised every year. So w it wouldn't have to be thirty-five million. We have we haven't run that number for years out. It would probably have to be ten or twelve percent. I, I based on that figure, it would probably have to be twelve, fourteen million dollars to get through three years. Okay, it would be because uh, you reset the base to a, that higher. It level. would be it would be two and a half percent more each year, so it would be seven and a half million dollars plus the ten, so it'd be seventeen million dollars. That, that could be the number that we got, yeah. But that's a big number, right? That's it's uh, a very large number. About six percent of the total. No, it's more than ten percent of the total. Seventeen million dollars. Oh, the deficit you're saying. Oh, oh you're talking yeah. deficit. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it would be uh, it would be uh, it would be uh, fifteen percent on the tax rate. <coughs> yeah. So I, I'm just wondering if that's you know that's a politically attainable number, and and the reason I'm asking the question is because everything that's built into the plan on the way out there is leading inexorably to that point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to think that the politically, the, the, 
I don't like to ever assume that there has to be an override, but there are certain pieces of math in this plan <coughs> that are what they are. Uh, and and we, we do everything we can to, to push and push and push. Mathematically, it probably works better if there's a smaller deficit in the year where you're asking for it, and then that next year there's that big deficit that represents itself, so that you can get through at least a three-year period with a number that may be politically palatable. I, I think, you know, the, the big issue <coughs> for us all to grapple with is, and, and you've hit on this already a little bit tonight, in 2011, we passed a $6.4 million override, assumed it would last three years, and then one of the big impacts was we went into the GIC. And so we're going to end up, if, if everything here stays remotely accurate, <coughs> we're going to end up with almost a decade without asking for an operating override. And I don't see anything else to the magnitude of the GIC happening again. So. Any expectations we've created that you could promise three and get four, five, six are not really realistic at all. So the next time we ask for three, we're probably going to get three or three, three and a half, <coughs> you know, or, or whatever it would be. So I, I feel like figuring out <coughs> over the next three, four, five years how we <coughs> work to set citizen expectations is, is, is a big challenge. I, mean, I think there's an understanding amongst some of the structural deficit and what that what that means for maintaining services, um, but it, it, it's still a, I think it is a constant reminder and education of to, to get to that point where people would vote for something. Well, it may be more than education. It may be having a more conservative spending plan. You know, as the governor said today with respect to the deficit, we're going to demonstrate that the state government can live within its means. <coughs> I'm just saying. <coughs> Might be something to think about. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the same governor who said that it's unacceptable that the T-trains weren't working and then cut their budget by $40 million. So sort of balancing service expectations and budgeting becomes very challenging. Yeah. <coughs> Tom, properties that we rent Yes. Where does that fall in the tree? That is a, a part of the local receipts revenue. Do you know what that number is, Dr. Kim? Total? Uh, just, just over 600,000. Yeah. Right just over 600? Yeah. And that doesn't include the central school, 23 May, the old Jersey Center. It doesn't. <coughs> okay. Those are independent. Okay. That's in the local receipts. It is. Okay, Alan? Uh, I hope you have some historical numbers and don't have to try to remember this, but <coughs> the, the reduction, phased reduction from 3.5% growth to 3% growth, do you remember what impact that had out in 2021? What, in other words, what, what would the 10,677 be if we hadn't had the reduction from 35 to 3? I was trying to put a... If we what, had what's not the result of, of a half a percent change? If we had not done it? If we had not done it. Or what, what's the result of a half a percent change over this time span? <coughs> yeah, I, you know. I'm sorry. I we should have brought that sheet. I mean, we have the numbers, so I want to. I want to say it was a several million dollar impact. Because we're about talking, uh, yeah, addressing this the balance that we were talking about. You know, what do you have to do to to make yeah. big changes out here? What are the little changes you have to do here? Yeah. What's the sensitivity? We can share that sheet with the committee. Mm -hmm. It's a summary sheet. It, yeah. that you can sort of see what all those different Yeah, you had about 12 yeah. scenarios. <laughs> I mean, a, a, a couple of the things, obviously, then trying to reduce the expenditures. Um, and, uh, you know, with a lot of pushback from, from certain appointing authorities uh, as far as not doing that. But, you know, and I, I applaud the manager for taking the charge of going to three and a quarter and then three, you know, for his budgets. Uh, and, and getting everybody else on board. Uh, the other issue is state aid. You know, it, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's 250,000 we're plugging in here. Going back to the bad old Dukakis days, we were getting six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year in new local aid. Uh, and, and even during the, the latter part of the 90s, we were getting five, six, seven hundred thousand in new local aid each year. 
it's really only been the last 10, 14 years <coughs> just the, the whole state uh, commitment to making Prop 2 and a half work, which is more local aid, has fallen apart. Yes. Uh, I'm hopeful the, with the new governor, who has tended to be much more of a favorable towards local aid, that he'll actually be able to produce what was in his campaign website, yeah. um, which is a straight regular increase in local aid each year. But of course, that will depend on a good economy. So. That, and the, both of those issues will be part of the Budget and Revenue Task Force next meeting. So. Okay, anybody else, Glenn? Uh, yeah, and the other solution to this problem, I mean, yes, we have to live within our means, but under two and a half, the means are determined by the voters if we let them. The other solution is to do an override earlier. If people understand the structural deficit issue, get ahead of it, it'd be a much smaller amount that we'd have to do. We could raise six or seven, ten million dollars in FY19 and last us for a five-year plan starting in 19, rather than waiting for the <coughs> crisis in 2021. So as we go forward, this is still a long way off, that's something that we can discuss and see how the numbers are going and get ahead of it rather than waiting for a crisis. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, if you have, you know, like I said, if you wake up in the middle of the night, write it down, call them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess I one. Charlie, Charlie brought it up and I hadn't even thought about it. Um, so I guess I thought it didn't exist anymore. Um, how much how much exempt debt, unissued exempt debt do we have? So you mentioned that the Stratton School would have exempt debt used for it. Do we have a lot? A little? No, I, I, don't. I, I, I would defer to your analysis of the, uh, the initial vote. <coughs> Um, this is the point at which I should ask to uh, have the salt passed while I eat the crow. <laughs> uh, somebody, when I was um, in the middle of the discussion of the CPA uh, vote a couple, several months back, somebody brought to my attention that in the, in the state law, a debt exclusion vote does not include a number, whereas an override vote includes a number. So the debt exclusion vote, in the, the two or three debt exclusion votes that we've taken, include, including the last one in 2000, in the year 2000, basically said, sh shall the town exclude the expenses to rebuild the Thompson, Stratton, Pearson, and um, I'm missing Hardy. Bracket. Bracket. Um, from the, from the limits of Proposition Two and a half, without attaching a number. Now, the the proponents and the the, the uh, pro debt exclusion campaign, of which I was co-chair at the time, we had presented a, a number to the finance committee and to the school committee and to the board of selectmen for what that total cost would be. And there's essentially there's broad leeway in that, uh, based on the way the law is written. And it's very similar in philosophy to the way we had to treat the Thompson when we, when we got, when the MSBA came back to, to us and said they're going to fund the Thompson. They said they were going to give us $10 million. But if you remember at town meeting, we still had to vote $20 million to rebuild the school. On the principle that if, for whatever reason, the state cut the budget, or whatever, you can't have commitments out there to vendors and to people or whatever, and then suddenly not have the ability to raise those funds. And I think that's the same spirit in the legislation on, on, a, on a debt exclusion. So um, in, from that view, I think that, um, and, and there, are some, there are some different communications from the DOR to the town on that. In, and um, in one of them, the DOR soundly rejected our early number our early financial limitation in, in, a, in one following, it wasn't quite so strongly rejected. But I think there's, a, there's an argument to be made that, this, that we can use uh, some, of this, some of this remaining debt exclusion authority to uh, fund the strategy. And I'm making it. So it is still there, though. Until the DOR says no. no. Well, and I only bring it up because it's in. Um, well, I mean, that's what the capital, the capital, we put the capital plan together 
for this year, which we'll present to the Finance Committee in probably in a month or so. Yeah, I mean, I only bring it up because it's interesting. We talk about um, transparency. I, um, I think if you asked 100 voters how are residents of the town, the lag time between an operating override vote and it hitting the bill, they'd get, they'd get it, right? I think if you ask people the lag time on a debt exclusion, most people would be clueless. That's right. Because I think most people have this understanding, and I think I've seen it, you've seen it in the past, right? Which is, you vote for it in, let's say, year X, let's say the year 2000. Well, right hits. I mean, that operating right hits in 2001, 2002, right away. Debt exclusions, they don't hit sometimes for five, six, Long seven years, depending right. like on the school rebuild. Right. And I just, you know, I just sort of. Yeah, the, other, the, other argument, the other argument is when the voters voted, we could, you can make the argument that the voters voted for the $34 million. But when they went into the voting booth, the $34 million wasn't on the vote. <coughs> and they actually voted to rebuild those buildings. They didn't vote for the $34 million. Right. right. So there's arguments on both sides of the fence. But in any event, um, the Capital Planning Committee will be proposing to the Finance Committee in town meeting that we use some debt exclusion funds along with selling some assets in the town and using non-exempt funds from within the regular capital budget to fund the $10 million or so for Stratton. Okay. Okay. The, uh uh, I wanted to give the town manager a little bit of a few minutes to just mention some budget highlights for next year for school 16. Yeah, sure. So um, really, really the, the, the big highlights are um, <coughs> uh, I guess the big highlight would be the proposal to create a joint town school facilities department, uh, which in this budget would have uh, the funding of a new facilities director position. Uh, so the year one proposal would be fund that position, 50% town, 50% school, uh, begin to coordinate the department. Year two, actually start to move budgets that are contained within some town departments and budgets that are contained within school departments into one independent operating facilities department. I'd like the opportunity for myself and Andrew to come back to talk more about that uh, at a future meeting, but I would say that's really, that that's the, the big significant change uh, in uh, the FY16 budget proposal. Uh, some other changes. Uh, last year I had sent a memo to the Finance Committee about a new uh, trash disposal contract uh, that the town signed. So that pretty significantly <coughs> reduced what we estimated our disposal costs would be for trash. Uh, that allowed us to bump up the snow and ice budget by another increment of $75,000. Um, we did uh, fund some uh, extended uh, or funded some uh, weekend hours in the library uh, that hadn't been funded uh, by the town in the past. They've been funded by private donations, uh, which were starting to, to weaken uh, in the, uh, the views of, uh, view of the library. Um, really. Yeah, that would, that would be the other big one. Veterans benefits uh, have really significantly increased uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, so we have uh, budgeted an increase of just about $70,000 anticipated in new or additional veterans benefits compared to last year. Uh, so, so that's a big change. Uh, I think part of it has to do with our, our new veterans director. He's getting a lot of people off the rolls that were inappropriately receiving benefits, but he's also doing a great deal of outreach to people in the community that were eligible for the benefits that are enabled by the state uh, that weren't aware of them and not collecting. Uh, so it's, it's been a, you know, I think he's doing a very good job, but it's producing a higher cost for us. Uh, aside from that, it really is, a, a, outside of that really that facilities uh, piece, it's a level service budget uh, that was put, to, you know, put together within the, the confines of the, uh, of the percentages that we talked about. Okay. Does sure. anybody have any questions to the manager on the budgets? I mean, we'll, we'll get them back at some point, oh, yes. said, to, to review that, but just at this point, Charlie? Yes. Uh, Adam, I happen to be at a selectman's meeting one night. When I caught a presentation, I think that you were giving, or some somebody in the town was giving, on a solar contract. Yes. yes. And um, I really <coughs> sort of didn't absorb all of it, other than I heard the number twenty-year contract, and I um, had a little spasm. So I'm working on uh, bef before I sign anything. I'm working on a memo for this committee, the board of selectmen, and the school committee, 
that sort of lays out all of it. So I'll probably be back in a, maybe just even a week or two okay. to talk about it. Yeah. <coughs> um, if you'll have me. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Manager. Uh, warrant articles. Um, we, we weren't able to get the warrant, and I've really got to talk to the selectmen how they keep moving the warrant back, <coughs> and we're not getting a finished warrant for a while, which really disturbs the things we have to do. Let me just run through the five or six articles I have here, and uh, any preliminary, uh, if you think there's a financial impact from your initial. Uh, so here's one zoning bylaw and regulation to see if the town will vote to amend the bylaws to allow for and regulate the posting of appropriate signage for notices of certain types of events on either public or private, including non limited town events, nonprofit events, personal yard sales, lost pets. Do you have any? I think it's a it's a good idea to regulate something that happens now without regulation, uh, and I don't think there's any funny, significant financial impact, if any at all. Okay, so you think this would probably basically be a, either a uh, redevelopment or a selectment? Yeah, we, we, uh, I think it was going to require a vote from both. Okay. So you don't see any kind of significant financial impact? Pro probably none. Okay, second one is uh, proposed uh, zoning review. See if the town will vote to amend the by zoning bylaw to require that all applications for building permits, special permits, and variances undergo a review for compliance with the zoning bylaw <coughs> by the inspector of buildings. The results of such be reviews be documented and kept on file by the inspector, and the document reviews be provided to the Arlington Redevelopment Board Zoning Board of Appeals before they take any actions, et cetera. Significant financial impact. How so? Probably the expansion of one to two administrative staff to be able to meet the needs uh, that are requested in that one article. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, every, anytime there's a, uh, a building permit given out, um, isn't there some kind of a written report or document or something? On that? Yeah, but I believe this is asking for a written report anytime there is any kind of zoning decision made, uh, which there is not a, a written report. Okay. At every, at every instance. Okay, so, okay, uh, Gloria, need them to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Loretti. Okay, board of, uh, <coughs> assessor change to see if the town will vote to implement the. Uh, okay, so this is making the board of the, uh, the uh, chief assessor an appointee by the manager and the board of assessors appointed. Um, Want to hear that? <laughs> Chris, we're ready. <coughs> so it was in the report, you know, most of the focus was on the treasurer collectors, but uh, the assessors were there, and I think everybody's followed the advocate or the. Uh, Sprague's website or uh, Arlington list on, on stuff like that. Um, uh, there's no appropriation asked. Yeah. Doesn't sound like anybody's. Okay, so selectman article. Uh, ah, Paul Schlickman. He always has interesting things. No. Petition for insertion of article. He wants to shorten the amount of time that people can speak on things that aren't a warrant article. So that one, that has a that warrant one? article. That are not a warrant, like resolutions or committee reports. No financial but significant. Yeah, I mean, sometimes those could knock out a half hour at the beginning of town meeting, yeah. so. Uh, okay, Human Rights Commission bylaw change. See if the town will vote to take any action. Uh, human. Uh, Human Rights Commission for Complaints Against Town Departments and Agencies. So is this spreading it out? I believe, I, believe uh, I, I haven't read the actual wording, but it would be to expand the authorities of the Human Rights Commission is my understanding, and I don't think that in and of itself would have uh, a direct financial impact. Okay. Legal fees? Yeah, I'm just Could result in that. Yeah. But I don't think that article would be asking for appropriations. 
Now the next one would, to see if the town will vote to take any action to appropriate funds for the position of Executive Director of the Human Rights Commission. I'm trying to... Yes, that we need to hear that one. Yeah. yeah. Gloria, why don't you ask uh, Mr. Harrington to come in and, and speak to both articles. I haven't looked at that commission for a while. We, we, we appropriate a X dollars, I think we increased yep. it a bit. And how is the, uh, how is that handled from uh, an administrative point of view? So there, there's a, uh, it's, in the past it had been uh, <coughs> a shared duty, uh, or not a shared duty, it was one administrative person had multiple duties for various uh, things in Health and Human Services, including the Human Rights Commission. That person then left the position, and I think it's currently still posted, right? Correct. For a, a very small part-time position to administratively staff the commission. Okay. $4,500. Yeah. Yeah, within the appropriate. Part-time now. Okay, so if you could go ahead and schedule those. Um, <coughs> I think that's all we had you guys in for. All right. Um, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but uh, you're also welcome if you'd like to head home. Uh, but thank you very much right. for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Now, that's not going to take up a whole night. Um, we could really use some budgets to review on Monday. Does anybody here have any budgets that they could review on Monday for us? No? No. Nope. I'm not working tomorrow. I'll call some people. Charlie, if you don't mind me meeting <coughs> without the whole group. Well, you should follow the process. Yeah. Okay, then no. Okay. <laughs> uh, how about Wednesday? We don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh, does anybody have a shot at getting some budgets ready for Wednesday? Uh, see, this is the problem when we don't have a warrant. Uh, you know, because usually we'd be filling these up with warrant articles. Okay, Gloria, could you please talk to them and see if they could we could switch it to Wednesday? Okay. John Billup is leaving Wednesday to Florida. And he won't be back until the third week of March. I hate to have you come in for a half hour's work. We've had them on speaker. Why don't we just tell them to send the article in and have which Greco bring it over? Just yeah. Okay. Um, why don't we, uh, we're Do going to cancel to Monday. To, Do you want me to try to get Chris Loretti and Steve Harrington in here Monday? Um, <coughs> although, there's probably, if the weathermen are right, there's probably not going to be a meeting. It's going to start snowing Saturday, and it's not going to stop until Tuesday morning. Okay. Oh, nice. Is that true? It might not be a meeting All Wednesday stations. either. <laughs> <laughs> Holy mackerel. It's not going to stop till April. Right? Yeah. Okay, why, why don't we do this? Uh, explain to them that, that literally that's the only thing we have. Okay. Ask if, if, if Rich Greco could come in on Wednesday. Yeah, that's the only thing we have. Ask if, if, if Rich Greco could come in on Wednesday. Try to schedule all those people in on Wednesday. Uh, Get to all the uh, get to all the uh, commissions and committees. Uh, what you've got, Harrington, uh, Stephen Harrington, Chris Loretti. Uh, try to get them in on Wednesday. Wednesday. And uh, and then I I really ask you know for people if, even if we can get small budgets out of the way, uh, and and see if we can get those done. Uh, if, try, try to get a yes or no on the committees and commissions. We can vote on that. Uh, so as of now, uh, Monday's meeting is canceled, and Wednesday's meeting is scheduled for the 7:45, um, and we'll discuss the posting. Actually, probably Friday, because our problem was town meeting was the town hall was not open on Monday. Fortunately, Adam was in the office and was able to post tonight's meeting <laughs> directly. So uh, it, it, these things really become a problem, and. Uh, and see if there's any other articles we need to look at in the warrant from uh, from Marie or the uh, Fran or uh, Mary Ellen. Uh, okay, so uh, warrants Monday meeting. Is there any other 
Any other business before the committee? Okay, committee's adjourned. Thank you.